All right, whenever you're ready. Welcome. At some point in your study of mathematics and science, you encounter vectors, matrices, and a long list of operations to perform using these objects to solve various problems. Sadly, the introduction to this subject, called linear algebra, is commonly done with too little motivation and too many recipes. The title of this talk is Why Linear Algebra? And the purpose is to give a straightforward answer that provides some motivation and theme for the vector and matrix algebra you learn in many courses. Somewhere in your youth, you learned the concept of a function. A function is a model for an input-output process. Some value x goes in, the process f happens when you turn the crank, and out comes the output y. Surely one of the first functions you ever learned about was this one. This was followed, roughly in order, by the rest of this list. And there's a reason for this list, why you start at the top and work your way down. It is simply because you start simple and get more complicated. One reason, one way to express why that first one is so simple is to look at what's involved. The two operations are simply multiplying by the constant c and then followed by addition. Multiplication and addition. Those two operations make up what are called linear functions. Now there's excellent news. As simple as linear functions are, they are already useful in their own right. You learn early in an algebra class that you can model distance as a function of time when the travel or the motion happens at a constant rate r. So already that's, that's a, a useful application. And then in Calculus 1, you learn how to take a arbitrary complicated function and approximate it by its tangent line using derivatives. But that tangent line is one of our simple functions. Why is it so effective? Because it's simple. Having learned a lot about functions of single variables, where you have a single input and a single output, the natural next step is to allow any number of input variables and any number of output variables. So x becomes now a list x1, x2, and so on, up to some number uh, xn of variables. We bundle those variables together into a single object that we call a vector. Similarly, the output, vec the output variable y now becomes a list, y1, y2, a number of output variables m, and we bundle the m output y variables into a single object called the output vector. Here are some examples. In the first example, there's a single input, multiple outputs. The single input represents time. The multiple outputs are the x and y coordinates of an object that's moving around in the two-dimensional plane. This is an example you meet in introductory physics. In the second example, there are three inputs and one output. The three inputs, x, y, z, are the spatial coordinates in three space and the output t is the temperature at that coordinate. In general, you can have any number of inputs, any number of outputs. The last example has four inputs, two outputs. For time, x, y, and z, we can imagine keeping track at every location x, y, z, and every time t, we might keep track of two outputs, the temperature t and the pressure p in, say, a liquid. So. <clears throat> These are multivariable examples that arise naturally in courses that you will study. Among all functions with multiple inputs and multiple outputs, the simplest ones are the ones that require just two operations, multiplication of input variables by constants and addition. These have the form output quantity equals a sum of constants times the input quantities. In symbols, it looks like this. Y is the output. X1 through Xn are the inputs. A1 through An are constants. 
We call an expression like this a linear expression or linear combination of the input variables x1 through xn. The main point is that these functions are the simplest we can reasonably hope to consider and it's necessary to understand them if we want to understand more complicated functions. Notice right away that we're going to need to do a certain amount of bookkeeping. In particular, there are many output variables, y1 through ym, so in general the equation looks like this. We have some y number i. It has an expression in terms of x1 through xn that involves constants, but these constants now need two subscripts, two indices to keep track of both the output that is over on the left side of the equation and the inputs that go from 1 to n. The data of a linear map is neatly encoded, you could say boxed up, in a rectangular array of constants called a matrix. So we take all those A's with their two subscripts, lay them out in rows and columns, and that becomes the collection of numbers that stands for the linear map. And what does that linear map do? It takes the x1 through xn's and turns them into the y1 through yms according to these equations. So the matrix itself is simply shorthand for this list of equations. But again, these are the simplest possible equations that could relate inputs to outputs. I will finish by summarizing the main point. Among all functions with multiple input variables and multiple output variables, the simplest are the linear maps. Their simplicity comes from the simple process rules. Input variables are multiplied by constants and added. That's all. Before we can have any hope of analyzing more complicated functions, we need to understand the linear ones. More positively, linear functions are already useful in their own right and serve as good approximations for more complicated functions, just like the tangent line works in Calculus 1. Recognizing that the algebra of linear maps is both necessary and useful, we set about to develop tools and vocabulary to analyze and use linear functions.